Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Kayode Okikiolu. Tonight, Northern Governors meet in Kaduna State, reject power shifts to the South, calls it unconstitutional. And on the day Northern Governors are meeting, bandits attack Madame Village in Kaduna, killing 34 people. Well, it's World Tourism Day as Cote d'Ivoire hosts landmark conference with a the theme, Tourism for Inclusive Growth. And Germany's centre-left Social Democrats claim victory after a narrow defeat of Chancellor Angela Merkel's party set to form a new coalition government. Plus, more international news from our London studio. Business news tonight. Ahead of October 1st celebration, Central Bank of Nigeria launches website for e-Naira, the country's first digital currency. Sports news tonight, four-time Grand Slam champion Naomi Osaka hints at return to tennis after taking a break from the game due to mental health issues. And from Abuja, Nigeria and Russia Chambers of Commerce ramp up efforts to boost bilateral relations. Meet Vice President Professor Yemi Oshimbajo in Abuja on consolidation of interests. Zoning of the presidency to the south does not have the buy-in of the northern governors as they rose from a crucial meeting today in Kaduna State, jettisoning the proposal by southern governors that the next president should emerge from the south. The governors of the northern states say zoning contradicts the constitution, which states that a majority wins the election. In the communique read by Chairman of the Forum and Governor of Plata State, Simon Lelong, the governors also resolved to work with the federal government and the armed forces in tackling insecurity in the northern region. It's a joint meeting of the northern governors and key traditional rulers from the northern states. And the meeting place is the government house in Kaduna State. The Sultan of Sokoto and the Governor of Kaduna State raised concern over the insecurity situation in the north. And I believe we are always ready to partner. I would like to thank some of the governors that we have known, or even all the governors who have done a lot to unraise the problem of security in our various states. Our region faces serious challenges. The economic situation in the country has affected us. The insecurity has destroyed rural economies and many other challenges about federalism stare us in the face. After several hours of meeting behind closed doors, the governors resolved that the call by their southern counterparts that the presidency be zoned to the south is unconstitutional. According to them, the 1999 constitution as amended states that an elected president must meet the constitutional requirements which include scoring majority votes and also score at least 25% of the votes cast in two-thirds of the states of the federation and nowhere is zoning allowed in the constitution. The forum unanimously condemned the statement by the Southern Governors Forum that the presidency must go to the south. The statement is quite contradictory with the provision of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended that the elected president shall A, score the majority votes, B, score at least 25% of the votes cast in two third states of the Federation, C, in the case of run-up, simple majority win the election, will win the election. The governors also react to the controversy on who collects value-added tax, a matter which is currently before the Supreme Court. The Northern State Governors Forum considered the ongoing national debate on collection of value-added tax, VAT, as responsible leaders 
While we are concerned by the fact that the matter is subjudice, we, however, for the purposes of educating the public, make the following observations. A, the judgment of the Federal High Court calls to question the constitutionality of VAT, withholding tax, education tax, Niger Delta Development Commission, National Information Technology Development Agency, 13% derivation, National Economic Development Council, and many other currently levied and collected by the Federal Government of Nigeria and the Federal Inland Revenue Service. B, Rivers and Lagos State Government had enacted their own VAT laws, and the Southern Governors Forum has, have expressed support for this course of action. C, VAT is being confused by these state governments as a sales tax. If every state enacted its own VAT law, multiple taxation will result in increase of prices of goods and services and collapse in interstate trade until and unless the Supreme Court pronounces judgment on the substantive matter between River State and the federal government, the matter is subjudice. And Northern State Governors Forum would respect this. This position conveyed by the Governor of Plateau State is unanimously agreed to by the governors of the 19 Northern States. It now remains to be seen how their counterparts in the South will respond to these strong views from the Northern Governors Forum. On the same day, Northern Governors and traditional leaders were meeting in the Kaduna State Capital, about 200 kilometers away in Kara local government area, suspected bandits attacked Madame village, killing 34 people. Seven other persons are believed to have sustained injuries, while some houses were burnt down by the attackers. Insecurity in the northern region has been a major source of worry to traditional rulers and governors of the region. And the Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Mr. Samuel Arwen, says troops mobilized to the location and engaged the bandits in a gun battle before the assailants withdrew. The commissioner reveals that two suspects have been arrested and are being questioned in connection with the attack. Meanwhile, Governor Nasser El Rufai has condemned the attack, describing it as an unspeakable display of wickedness, meriting the severest form of punishment. Governor El Rufai, who said that the Kaduna State Government will bear the full cost of injured victims' treatment, has also ordered an urgent assessment of the area by the State Emergency Management Agency towards the provision of soccer to the affected households. And just this evening, reports say eight persons have been killed in a reprisal attack in Kassasar village in Zango Kataf, local government area of the state. Six persons were also injured and several houses raised by the attackers during the operation. According to the State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Mr. Samuel Arwand, the attack was a reprisal to early attacks in neighboring Jankasa village where one man was killed and Madami village where 34 persons were killed. Meanwhile, troops of Operation Hadarin Daji, in conjunction with other security agencies, successfully repelled an attack by suspected Islamic states for West Africa province terrorists and bandits on the Ford Operation Base at Burkusuma in Sabombirni, local government area of Sokoto State. The attack on the remote border settlement with Niger Republic uh, was said to have come by the attackers in large numbers using telecom network provided from a neighboring country. The reinforcement by Nigerian troops helped to counter the attack as many of the ISWAP fighters were eliminated while some fled with various degrees of injuries. Well, still on security, the Nigerian Navy is disturbed by the lack of armories in some bordering countries, a situation that makes it difficult for Nigeria to fight insecurity and control the proliferation of small arms and light weapons into the country. Commander Jamila Malafa, who represented the Navy at the public hearing of the House of Representatives, stated that the Chadian soldiers have weapons under their beds, well, they, which they sell in the black market when they need money. And she's suggesting that Nigeria should consider building a wall against neighboring countries if peace must be guaranteed. Our correspondent Terry Kumi reports. The House of Representatives Committee on National Security and Intelligence holds a public hearing on four security-related bills, including two executive bills on the establishment of a national commission against the proliferation of small arms and a repeal of the Explosives Act. 
representatives of the various heads of security agencies and relevant stakeholders are seated as the event is declared open by the Speaker of the House of Representatives. I ask all of you to make full use of this opportunity to contribute your perspectives to improve these bills and protect our country in the best way we can. As I have always said, Nation building is a joint task. Most of the submissions center on establishment of the Commission on Small Arms and the Explosives Act. That the membership actually should be expanded to include all agencies and law enforcement agencies that are arm bearing and have very intrusive form of investigation. Nigeria has over 350 million small arms and light weapons out of an estimated 500 million small arms and light weapons in circulation in West Africa. The fertilizers have been sold to unscrupulous persons mm. who use the chemical substance locally as explosive material to manufacture IED. The Navy, however, expresses worry over weapons handling in neighboring African countries. Average Chadian soldier has 20 to 30 arms underneath his bed. When he's broke, he brings it out and sells it for $30, $20. I am here, I am standing here, and I'm saying it. Since we are going to collaborate with ECOWAS and other countries that are donating such arms to these countries, I think we should insist that they should either enact laws to govern the handling of these arms and ammunition, or build an armory for these countries, or else we will not see peace. Though they said even Berlin Wall has been knocked down, I think we should build a wall between us and these neighboring countries, or we should have a serious surveillance or else we will not see peace in this country. I'm telling you this. Nigeria is a signatory to the ECOWAS Treaty on Small Weapons, which is yet to be domesticated in the country. But the House Committee questions the role of the Foreign Affairs Minister. This treaty, especially the one on small arms, is already signed. We're only trying to domesticate it, which means Nigeria is already tied with all the errors. While the Minister of Foreign Affairs not involve the NSA, Minister of Internal Affairs, security agencies and other, because at the end of the day, foreign affairs is not going to collect light weapons or collect even any weapon at all. Of whatever, For almost whatever all the invited guests, the proposed Commission on Small and Weapons should be headed by the Minister of Interior and not the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Of Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. A lawyer from security, today is World Tourism Day and the theme for this year's celebration is Tourism for Inclusive Growth. Well, this year's celebration is being hosted by Côte d'Ivoire, fully showcasing the potential of tourism to create jobs for all and bring communities together. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a massive social and economic impact on both developed and developing economies with marginalized groups and the most vulnerable hit the hardest. The UN World Tourism Organization says the restart of tourism will help kickstart economic recovery and growth. The channel's television's business correspondent, Inijan Mekwa, is in Cote d'Ivoire and tells us more. 125 participating countries, over 1,500 individuals present here. Physically, thousands more joining virtually. This is how the celebration of World Tourism Day for 2021 looks like, hosted by Côte d'Ivoire with the theme Tourism for Inclusive Growth. And conversations here goes for how to spread the benefit in tourism from the tourist, tourism sector from the big airlines to the small businesses. As we know, tourism has a very long value chain. So we see individuals here showing off their goods and their services through exhibition. What is on the mind of a lot of people as they meet here is to finding innovative ways to sustain the growth in the tourism sector and to make it spread to other parts of the economy, not just here in Côte d'Ivoire, which is hosting this year's uh, event, but of course around the world, outside Africa and everywhere. That's the story here from Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire as we celebrate the World Tourism Day for 2021. I'm Ini John Mekwa reporting for Channel Television News. Well, in part two after the break, we'll be bringing you more on the World Tourism Day, especially as it concerns Nigeria. Plus, the Federal High Court in Abuja adjourned suit challenging eligibility of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar to contest for the office of President.
John Skin. Welcome back to the news at 10. If you're just joining us, here's a recap of our major stories. Northern governors and leaders meet in Kaduna State, reject power shifts to the south, says plan is unconstitutional. 34 people are killed by bandits in Madame Village on the day Northern governors meet in Kaduna. Cote d'Ivoire hosts landmark conference with a theme, Tourism for Inclusive Growth, as World Celebrates the Tourism Day. And after a narrow win over the Christian Democratic Party, Germany's centre-left Social Democrats set to form a new coalition government. Sustained with this year's World Tourism Day, Nigeria is a nation blessed with numerous tourism potentials scattered around the country. In this special report, our correspondent Olu Phillips takes a look at some tourism locations in the north, southwest, and other parts of the country. As richly endowed as Nigeria may be, there is a need to grow the existing tourism potential such that the nation can earn more revenue from travel and tourism. Power of Tourism for Inclusive Growth. September 27th every year is recognized and designated World Tourism Day. But what's the big deal about tourism? A quick check at tables of leading countries for tourism arrival, international tourism receipts or by international expenditures leaves Nigeria ranking low among other African countries and globally. <laughs> But how have we excluded ourselves in this conversation of billions of dollars available to this sector? We took a tour of some potential sites that could promote tourism around the country and their challenges. One of the foremost sites is the Yankari Resort in Bauchi State, a state nicknamed the Pearl of Tourism, owing to the numerous tourist attractions. Aside Yankari, there are more than 10 tourist sites in the state, some of them developed, others are not. If the state is really serious about tourism development, they should put some actions on ground. The first thing is, I think they should bring out a tourism master plan. Although Bauchi State is relatively safe, but like many parts of the Northeast region, insecurity has ravaged the tourism sector. From Bauchi State, we move to the north central region of the country. Quara this time, and what do we have? There seems to be a lot to be done by governments at all levels to ensure commercial viability of tourism centers in the state. This is the Sierra Museum in Irekpodu local government area established in 1945. Not much can be seen or said in terms of commercial viability. The Kajala waterfalls in the Felodu local government area also said to be the longest in West Africa is as deserted as it could possibly appear. But the government says it is upbeat on getting these sites to world map. Still in the north central region is Plateau State, known as the home of peace and tourism. There are numerous tourist attractions spread across the local government areas with attractive hills Pontinous areas as well as recreational centers. There is the National Museum, JOS, a tripartite tourist center. All the tourist attractions scattered across the state include its fair hills, Wasi Rocks, as well as the Pandam Game Reserves and the Kurang Volcanic Mountain. Let's take you down to the south south region of the country. Cross River State hosts an annual carnival which draws tourists and have brought in some economic fortune to the state. Some tourists who visited the Obudu Ranch Resort, another attraction to the state, holiday home. Abiyakuta in Ogun State perhaps has been made popular as a tourist site by the distribution of rocks in the Asian city and the famous Oluma Rock. 
Olumarok as a tourism site is a fusion of the old and the modern, an historic site, pride of the Agbars. During its downtime, it records about 1,500 visitors and doubles that at peak periods. Everywhere in Lagos appears all built up with a few historic sites that support this sector. The National Theatre is one of the historic destinations in Lagos. It is an architectural masterpiece that was built some 45 years ago, but in recent years, the edifice has become a shadow of itself. Prompting the recent intervention by the federal government and the Lagos state government, partnering with the Central Bank of Nigeria for restoration. The COVID-19 pandemic provided a reset button for the globe. The United Nations World Tourism Organization says it represents an opportunity to rethink the future of tourism sector. Will Nigeria join the League of International Destinations for Tourism? The figures will tell when computed during another celebration next year. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. Clearly so much potential. Let's head over to the courts where the Federal High Court in Abuja has adjourned to December the 6th. A suit challenging former Vice President Atiku Abubakar's eligibility to vie for the office of the President. Justice Inyageko adjourned the suit following the inability of the parties in the suit to regularize the amended processes to accommodate the fifth defendant, that is the Attorney General of Adamawa State, who had been joined in the case. The Adamawa State Government had on July the 27th sought an order of the court to be joined in the suit. A civil society organization had sued the former vice president, challenging his eligibility to contest the presidency on the grounds that he was not a Nigerian citizen by birth. In Justice Taiwo Taiwo of the Federal High Court Abuja has ordered the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice Abubakar Malami to take over the prosecution of former Governor of Imo State, Ikedio Hakim. The police had initially filed criminal charges against Mr. Hakim over alleged harassment, threat to life and threatening to release a nude photograph of Cheyere Igwebe if she fails to drop charges of attempted kidnap against him. The Abuja-based woman, Chinyere Gwigwe, later filed a notice of discontinuance of the matter in March 2021, the same day the AGF informed the court that it has taken over the prosecution of a hakim. Consequently, Justice Taiwo states that the court cannot give effect to the notice of discontinuance filed by the police and the move to discontinue the matter lacked merit. In view of the ruling, the court then fixed October the 21st for the arraignment of a former governor, as well as commencement of trial. Staying with judicial matters, the Lagos State Governor Babajide Sonwulu has assured the state's judiciary of its continued cooperation and support to ensure improved access to justice for all citizens, irrespective of social and economic status. Well, this assurance was given today at the ceremonies to kickstart the 2021-2022 new legal year. Well, simultaneous Thanksgiving services were held by the judges, magistrates and judicial staff workers at the Lagos Central Mosque and the Cathedral Church of Christ Marina. And this was closely followed by the parade of guards at the Tafar Balewa Square, signaling the official commencement of activities in the courts. For more on the news at 10, let's head over to our Abuja studio where Terry Kumi is standing by. Good evening, Terry. Good evening, Kayode. Nice to see you. The volume of trade between Nigeria and Russia may improve in a matter of weeks, going by the move by both countries to ramp up trading activities. The latest move also includes plans to establish the Nigeria-Russia Chamber of Commerce and Industry to boost the economic relations between both countries. Members of the proposed Chamber of Commerce were guests of the Vice President, Professor Yemi Shibajo, in Abuja today. Our correspondent, Kela Megwa, reports. After five decades of bilateral relations, the trade volume between Nigeria and Russia is about a billion dollars. To increase this figure, the newly established Nigeria-Russia Chamber of Commerce and Industry are ramping up efforts aimed at improving trade potentials between both countries. We are ready to fight concurrence with, uh, on uh, the world market uh, for your country because we think there's a future with African continent and with Nigeria, the biggest economy in this region. And uh, we know that you have a lot of things. You have a very big demographic potential. You have resources. 
you have a will to build a better future. Earlier, the delegation met with the Vice President, Professor Yemi Shimbajo. The courtesy visit is a prelude to the formal inauguration of the Nigeria-Russia Chamber of Commerce and Industry. A statement from the media aide to the Vice President, Mr. Lao Lua Konde, reveals that the Vice President is surprised that such a structure does not exist, explaining that the formalization of the Chamber will improve trade relations between both countries. The leader of the delegation speaks on the impact the Chamber would have on the long-standing relationship between both countries. Vice President had um, promised the commitment to give all the cooperation to our chambers and all the understanding that is needed to improve this new economic relationship. He's, he welcomed this visit, he welcomed the idea of the potentials and, um, and, uh, and thanked the Russians for the good relationship and cooperation that they have enjoyed with Nigeria in the last few years. So, and um, promised, we promised him that we will uh, we'll keep in touch with him on the development. The inauguration of the chamber, which is projected to happen in a couple of weeks, is expected to strengthen relations between both countries, especially in the areas of energy, ICT, agriculture and infrastructure. When the news at 10 returns, ahead of the October 1 celebration, Central Bank of Nigeria launches website for e-Naira, the country's first digital currency. That's on business news plus more news from Abuja to stay with us. Welcome back to the News at 10, coming to you live from Chattel's Television. There is no other option than to diversify the economy. That's the view of the President of the Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan. He says now is the time for Nigeria to invest more in agricultural activities such as poultry, fishing and livestock farming. He was speaking in Gasamul community in Gashua local government area of Yobe State, where he commissioned the Presidential Integrated Farm Estate established by the National Agricultural Lands Development Authority. As part of the federal government's efforts to boost agriculture in the country, the National Agricultural Land Development Authority is setting up an integrated farm estate in Yobe State, northeast Nigeria. The plan is to revive and scale up the agribusiness for food sufficiency. This farm has the capacity of generating 850, bed, 850 eggs daily. The President of the Senate laments Nigeria's over-dependence on oil as he explains the need for the diversification of various aspects of the nation's economy. Our economy has been dependent on one single commodity, and that is the oil, the petrol. Petrol or oil does not provide so much employment opportunities. There could be revenues, but definitely not commensurate opportunities in terms of employment. But when you are diversifying in agriculture, you will have much more people engaged, especially our youth, who today are largely unemployed or underemployed. Thanking the federal government for the project, Governor May Malabuni of Yobe State, who was represented by the Secretary to the State Government, is pledging to ensure that the project is sustained. Also commend the National Agricultural Land Development Authority for establishing the center which I consider a remarkable complementary effort of the present administration of it towards environmentalization agriculture for prosperity and the stronger nation. I would like to take this opportunity to share with that we are ready to cooperate with NADA to well, ensure that this project is very sustained. Let me take this opportunity to reiterate my appeal to all and sundry to continue to pray for the full return of peace in the world of North East and the other parts of the country. The residents are also hoping that the project would reduce the level of unemployment in the area caused by Boko Haram insurgency. And that's all from the nation's capital. Let's go to Lagos now, where Anne Waldo is standing by for business news. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank.
Thanks a lot, Terry. Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin with the Central Bank of Nigeria launching a website for the operations of e-Naira, and that's the country's first digital currency one week before the official kickoff. According to the information on the e-Naira website, the digital currency will ensure easier financial transactions for users. It would also allow peer-to-peer -peer payments through a linked bank account or a card. Also, the e-Naira will facilitate cash distribution in the government's social welfare programs. The CBN Governor Godwin Amefele is optimistic that the e-Naira, the first in Africa, will bring about increased cross-border trade, accelerate financial inclusion, and lead to cheaper and faster remittance inflow. Global ratings agency Fitch has upgraded the Bank of Industries national long-term rating to triple A, and that's coming up from the initial double AA plus status. At the same time, it also affirmed the BOI's long-term issuer default rating at B with a stable outlook. Fitch explains that its assessment is primarily a reflection of the bank's importance, its policy, and the role in funding growth on the economy of Nigeria. The BOI is the country's primary development bank with a mandate of financing the industrial sector. Let's talk about oil prices. They have maintained their gains for a fifth consecutive day with the brand screwed futures just a few steps away from the $80 mark. And this is coming amid concerns of global supply as part of the world and now seeing demand pick up with the easing of pandemic conditions. The international oil price benchmark climbed higher by 1.58% to $79.32 a barrel, while its contemporary, that's the U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude, jumped by 1.76% to $75.28 a barrel at 8.40 p.m. local time today. Meanwhile, analysts are saying that rising gas prices are also helping to drive higher liquid because relatively cheaper from power generation. Back home, Nigeria's capital market has raised 176 billion naira in four years, indicating its potential to bridge the country's infrastructure gap, and that's according to the Securities and Exchange Commission. In a statement, the commission's uh, commissioner for operations, Dayo Bisson, explains that several options could be explored from the domestic capital market to bridge the infrastructure gap. He also pointed out the Islamic bond, or the Sukuk, as one of such options which has been used to raise funding for critical projects in various sectors of the economy. In a bearish start for this week at the domestic stock market, stocks shrank today by 0.25% following a crash in trade volume of over 70%. Bukola Samuel Wemimo has a summary. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. It was deeply a red session in the equities market as stocks continued the sluggish movement observed at intraday. <laughs> share index fell 0.25% with about 51 billion naira sliced off the market capitalization. The red skies also clouded the activity chart as both volume and value of shares traded were 70% lower when compared with Friday's session. However, on the sectoral chart, the performance was broadly positive as all key indexes recorded gains, leaving the insurance counter as the only loser for today. On the list of top trades, Sovereign Trust Insurance led the chart, contributing over 19 million shares to the overall volume. Now, let's take a look at the gainers for today. University Press led that counter, closely followed by Transco Hotels PLC and Courtville Business Solution. Traders say speculators are currently dictating the pace of the market and advise cautious trading in this holiday shortened week. What we hope is just a storm in a teacup. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Back to you. I'll see how the rest of the week goes. Meanwhile, U.S. stock market has closed on Monday as traders brace for the final week of volatile September. Let's see the snapshot of closing numbers for today.
more hour do. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with day. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Well, thanks, Anne. Still ahead on the news at 10, Germany's centre-left Social Democrats set to form a new coalition government after narrowly defeating the party of Europe's longest-serving leader, Angela Merkel. Join us again. Let's now join Simon Pusey for international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. <laughs> Germany's centre-left Social Democrats have claimed victory in the federal election with the Conservatives suffering their worst ever performance. While the two parties have governed together for years, SPD leader Olaf Scholz has said it's time for a new coalition with the Greens and Liberals. The Greens made history with almost 15% of the vote, even though it was well short of their ambitions. The election was dominated by climate change and by differing proposals on how to tackle it. For now, the outgoing Chancellor is going nowhere until the coalition is formed. The main parties want a new government in place by the time Germany takes over the leadership of the G7 Group of Nations in January. Meanwhile, Iceland briefly believed it had made history by electing Europe's first female majority parliament before a recount showed it had just fallen short. Some 30 of the 63 seats were won by women, unlike the earlier results that showed women winning 33 seats. No European country has breached the 50% threshold, with Sweden coming closest at 47%. Australia's Prime Minister has signalled he may not attend the UN's landmark climate conference in November, as his government faces continued criticism of its poor climate record. In an interview, Scott Morrison said he had not made any final decisions on attending, suggesting it was a burden. The COP26 summit will be the biggest global climate crisis talks in years. Hundreds of farmers in the Indian states of Punjab and Haryana have blocked roads in more protests against agricultural laws. Farmers who have been camping at Delhi's borders since November want a repeal of the laws on the liberalisation of the sector that they consider unfair and exploitative. Several rounds of talks between farming unions and the government have brought no results. <laughs> Footage shows clashes between police and the farmers, with police detaining some protesters. Floods left by tropical storm Diam Nhu have inundated some areas in central Vietnam three days after the storm made landfall. National TV showed footage of flooded streets and neighborhoods across the area. Authorities have dispatched rescue teams to send food aid to stranded residents in some of the affected areas. At least 600 houses have been damaged and 2,500 acres of crops destroyed. Up to 90% of British fuel stations have run dry across English cities after panic buying deepened a supply chain crisis triggered by a shortage of truckers. Footage shows cars queuing for fuel and empty gas stations. Ministers have asked people to refrain from panic buying, explaining that the problem comes from people buying petrol they wouldn't usually need. Prime Minister Boris Johnson is considering using the army to drive tankers around the country. State-backed media and China have heralded the return of a Huawei top executive as a chance to reboot relations with the US. The declaration was made following the release of Ms. Meng, the Chinese tech executive, after being detained in Canada for nearly three years. Ms. Meng was accused of bank fraud by the US, but was freed thanks to a deal between Canada and US prosecutors. China also released two Canadians accused of espionage and detained in retaliation for Miss Wang's arrest. The apparent swap brings to an end a damaging diplomatic row between Beijing and the West. At least one person has been killed and nine injured after a 5.8 magnitude earthquake hit the Greek island of Crete. The man died when the dome of a church that was being renovated in a town caved in. People were sent rushing out onto the streets when the earthquake struck. Several aftershocks followed. Civil protection authorities said many buildings had been damaged. 
And finally, sumo wrestling's greatest champion, Hakuo, is set to retire after more than 1,000 wins. He rose to the top ranks of sumo wrestling after arriving in Japan from his native Mongolia at the age of 15. But the 36-year-old had been plagued by persistent knee injuries and received a warning for injury absences earlier this year. During his career, Hakuo recorded more titles, wins and perfect championships than any other wrestler in history. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thanks, I mean, four-time Grand Slam champion Naomi Osaka looks set to return to tennis shortly after getting the desire to play again. Osaka took a break from the game to concentrate on her mental health following a third-round defeat by Leila Fernandez at the US Open. The 23-year-old Japanese player who pulled out of next month's BNP Paribas Open in Indian Wells has struggled for form since she withdrew from the French Open in May following a row with tournament officials over required media appearances. A Frenchman Benoit Paire snapped a three-match losing streak at the Sofia Open to reach the second round. Paire defeated seventh seed Alejandro Davidovich Fokina 6-4, 7-5. The world number 49, who was making his debut at the ATP 250 event held on indoor grass courts or indoor hard courts, a broke serve five times and played aggressively from the baseline to advance after one hour and 37 minutes. Uh, Paris Saint-Germain Mauricio Pochettino, the head coach of the club, insists his squad is in good shape ahead of the blockbuster clash against Manchester City FC in the UEFA Champions League. Now, Pochettino confirmed that Lionel Messi and Marco Verratti are likely to make the cut after recovering from recent injuries. Messi has missed the past two matches against Metz and Montpellier with a knee issue, while Verratti has been out for longer with a more serious knee injury. But both have been training in the build-up to the clash with Pep Guardiola's side. Yes, uh, Leo is, uh, is in the same position of uh, Marco. He's, uh, he's in a very good way to he's evolve really well. And, and I think... Uh, will be in the in the squad for for tomorrow. Uh, I still not decide the, the starting eleven, and of course uh, they need time to work all together. A Liverpool FC manager Jurgen Klopp says the defensive issues on display against Brentford in the English Premier League are not too much of a concern, but does not want his team to repeat those mistakes in the Champions League group game at Porto. Liverpool have had the upper hand against Porto in recent meetings, winning 5-0 and 4-1 on their last two visits to the Estadio do Dragao in 2018 and 2019. England all-rounder Moin Ali on Monday announced he was retiring from Test cricket to focus on his white ball career, with captain Joe Root saying he would be a huge loss to the red ball side. Now, the 34-year-old scored five centuries and took 195 wickets in 64 tests, including a top score of 155 not out and five wicket hauls. And that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Ayotunde Balogun. Back to you, Kayode. Well, thank you, Ayo. And the main news again. Northern governors meet in Kaduna State today where they rejected power shift to the south, calling it unconstitutional. And on the same day, 34 people were killed by suspected bandits in Madame Village, also in Kaduna State. And that's the news at 10. Thank you for watching. I'm Kayo Kikilu. Thank you for watching. Good night.